Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is presented by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build a great relationship with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or support at rise25media.com. Rick Spell is a CPA with a 30-year investment banking career. He's also a buyer of companies. He and his daughter, Christy, have established both casual and fine dining restaurants at nine locations in South Walton and Panama City Beach, Florida, Memphis, Tennessee, and Jackson, Mississippi. Rick is also a member of the University of Memphis Board of Visitors, former president of the fundraising board for the University of Memphis Athletic Department, and is a lifetime ambassador club member representing the highest level of financial contributions to the athletic department. Rick, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, we're, we're getting a long way through the, uh, the COVID environment we've been in, so everything is upbeat here, I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. I'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get more into that as we go along. So you, uh, you have been a CPA and an investment banker for decades. And in 2004, I believe you purchased Brookhaven Pub and Grill in Memphis. What made you decide to do that after kind of a, you know, more of a financial driven career? So, uh, actually it, it, it's because of my financial career. What I buy is I try to buy assets that I believe are undervalued, but that first package of purchase in 2004 uh, I was sitting at a restaurant eating. We left it. It was a bar restaurant, Brookhaven Pub and Grill. And somebody said, uh, you know, Marcus is selling this. And he had been a uh, he had been an officer in the army. And 10 years out of being out, they called him back for the Iraq war. He had a six month old child. His wife didn't even know him when he was in the service. He had to leave. And so he needed to unload a restaurant. I had a brother who was a bartender. And so I really purchased it really family oriented. Little did I know that that would be a significant purchase and would be where I started putting a lot of my funds. Uh, so we we really uh, learned the business from that first uh, model. And, and the model worked for me being a finance guy and, and not being a restaurateur. Um, you know, I have to have good local management. So we sat down with the manager of the restaurant and said, look, if you don't like me, if you don't want to stay, let me know when I'm not buying. And so that's how we got our start. Well, wow, so it hinged basically on the manager who was already there. A absolutely. We, we do. We need good managers to run restaurants. And the, the good news about having multiple restaurants is you start uh, developing, you know, a, a good uh, bench to move people around. For example, I just moved an assistant manager in Jackson. Uh, down to Florida because it's a much better opportunity for her. And then we just moved a, an assistant manager here in Memphis uh, to the general manager of Brookhaven Pub. And so we, we have a lot of on the job, you know, uh, interviews going on, so to speak, or, or you know, as, so we're always watching the people. And, and that's a, a, a great pride that we take in the business of growing. People, and we've been very successful with that. So you had no prior uh, experience in the restaurant industry? I, I worked at Mug and Cone when I was 16 for uh, nine months uh, on the grill. Uh, <laughs> was there was there anything from that experience that carried over? <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd have to say the enjoyment of working in a restaurant. I mean, when you're a new employee and don't know what you're doing and you have older people that teach you not to be dumb. Um, that's a real learning experience. So in the restaurant business now, you know, I really, uh, we have over 500 employees. I really view it that we, we, we have the ability to help people's lives, people that are in college, people that are working 
their first job, people that are or have been in this job for 20, 25 years. So we take our family responsibility and how we treat our employees very seriously. I mentioned in the in your intro that you are partnering with your daughter. What made you decide to do that? Well, <laughs> uh, you, you don't want to get into family politics, but uh, I'll I'll give you the short version. Um, she, uh, I was I bought this and was going to partner with my brother, the bartender, the general manager that I mentioned. His only problem was Rick. I'm I'm comfortable, but I'm not comfortable with your brother. It looks like you're going to train him to replace me. And so I said, if if he was not involved, would you be interested? And he said, yes, I would. And as luck would have it, he knew my daughter. So my daughter was a corporate accountant uh, and uh, and she came on board. So she kept her full time job and she came on board and did the financial work, you know, after hours. She and I both have always had two jobs. And so she did that for, I would say, about four years. And that was uh, she was young enough then that there was a lot of uh, father daughter fighting. Uh, as mm-hmm. you get kids that are older, you realize uh, there is a, an age where they think they know more than you. And um, she's actually come out on the other side, and and she's a big part of our success uh, because administratively POS systems how to make things more efficient. Neither one of us uh, actually have a great back of house or front of house ex- experience. So I really believe it's one of our secrets. The way we approach this business is, is we look at a restaurant as a customer. And so my wife and I to this day, every time we're in one of our restaurants and we try to eat at least once, maybe twice a day in our restaurants, we're always watching. Uh, and, and for example, the hostess stand is, is always a, a, a person that is maybe not really experienced in the business. She's younger. She can be intimidated. And she has to tell people that are older, uh, you're going to have to wait 20 minutes. Uh, or maybe she's not doing a good enough job being there and greeting people. So so we watch it as customers and, and we give advice as customers to the r- real pros in the business, which is the manager. You know, this, this question may not be totally appropriate for you since you based a lot of your uh, purchase decision on the staff that was already in place. But, you know, a lot of restaurateurs really struggle when they first start. But what were the what were the early days of your ownership of Brookhaven Pub and Grill like? You know, it, it's um, it, it, you you know the story, um, Rick. Why would you invest in restaurants? You're going to have your head in. And and if I could segue a little forward, when I bought the first two restaurants I bought in Florida, um, you know the the I was at a company. I was a manager at a company. Um, and I was preparing for leaving because I knew I didn't have the capability to retire. I had to do something with it. And that, that's become buyer of the business. You know, the, the question is always, oh, are, is there something wrong with you? What, what, what are you thinking? But, but the truth is, owning a restaurant, can, if it makes money, and we try not to buy restaurants that don't make money, and we have started one that we just closed this year, Grits and Grind, um, it's actually very enjoyable. You're working around a bunch of great people. Uh, yeah, there's a few knuckleheads in the business, but generally I've found that you you have a chance to help people in their lives and, and we have a responsibility to to make uh, our our employees have a great place to work. And we take that very seriously. So um, I don't really have any stories uh, other than a few about the early days, but because we are very financially oriented. So we, in essence, we're run, learning from our manager as he was learning from us on financially, what was the best way to run the business? I will say this though. I did get a call at one o'clock on a Friday. Uh, and it was from someone that knew me. And he said, uh, Rick, and we, and we have uh, music at Brookhaven. We charge a cover charge to get in uh, after nine or 10 o'clock. And he said, Rick, uh, you know, you don't know me really well, but uh, Brookhaven pub is my favorite place. My brother and I were up there and we just went in there and, uh, you you have a uh, bartender that is drinking or doing drugs, and uh, they got into a fight with this, and then they chased us around the block. And uh, you know you've got to do something about this. Well, he woke me up, and that's a great story. So I had to go up and and uh, you know see what was going on because we're not going to treat people that way. But of course, you know that's probably not the true story. So we have cameras at doors, and you can see the true stories. 
and you can see what really happened. So um, you know, you do have experiences like that. We've had a couple of employees that you know did things in in their life away from the restaurant that you know uh, were very disappointing. But generally, we've been really, really fortunate. Those kinds of things probably not things you really had to deal with as a CPA. You know, uh, you know, I, I was a CPA for four years. I was an investment banker for thirty years. Uh, I, that is the big difference in the restaurant business. There, there are things like that that happen that you have to deal with. And um, and and I'd be less than candid if I didn't tell you that, you know, you have something happen once a year, twice a year, five times a year with employees. Uh, sometimes you can help them. Uh, sometimes you can't. Um, I think one of the things that that we deal a lot with now is is online reviews, and I review every uh, bad online review, and, and weekly I have the the good online reviews summarized for us so that you can show the managers. Uh, and, and and we're we're fortunate to have great managers, so when you're showing them bad reviews, it it just is very depressing. But again, back to my point of um, you know you you have to look at a review as as a customer and is some of them you see you know they have another agenda but most of them you can tell when you just let them down and they want some way to speak to you so um you know that that is something that that you know all restaurants have to deal with how do you manage your reviews how do you how do you make it a positive learning experience and then and you know i'd be less than candid if i didn't tell you there's a lot of people in restaurants that you know want to say well you know that 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 a uh, customer didn't understand. Well, it doesn't matter that he didn't understand. We've got to be better at helping them understand. So it's it's a it's a fun business. Not every day is the same, and and you work around a bunch of great people. I I, I just can't overemphasize how lucky I am. Not only my management staff, but in so many of our workers that really try to serve people well. Was there ever so you, you like I mentioned you owned that for several uh, years before you decided to expand. Was there a major turning point where you thought, you know, this is going well, we're ready to branch out and move further into this industry? So I'd like to give you two stories there. You mentioned Brookhaven Pub, which was my first one in 2004. Uh, and, and it was a old house that was converted and had a, um, a patio on it, which we immediately covered. And we started having the football coach at the University of Memphis there. and um, as our team got better, I, I felt a little embarrassed that that my patio went better. So we did a, a million dollar remodel and made you know one of the best patios in Memphis. Were always uh, stated that way. And we had since then did another remodel. And then just a couple of months ago, we did I put another patio on the front because in the back is music and you know it's a little more of a drinking environment. So we, we kind of had a softer crowd in the front. Uh, so. We've always continued to remodel our restaurants. Uh, now, now let me answer your question. Um, what made me go from one restaurant to more? So as, I, 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 it was time for me to leave my investment banking job because my, my, the people that I worked with and had, had grown and, and, and trained, they knew it as much as I did. And so in essence, I, I, I knew it was time to exit or what I like to say is I fired myself. I'm originally from California. My intention was to go live on the coast in Los Angeles, Santa Monica. Um, and I couldn't find a business to purchase. And so we we said at that time we weren't looking at restaurants. And, and somebody said, well, look, you can buy restaurants at these yield levels. And we weren't afraid of restaurants. So we agreed to buy a breakfast chain out in uh, Los Angeles area. And at the same time, we had somebody call us from Florida um, and that was offering to sell two restaurants. And so we agreed to buy both of them. And the one in California, they were not experienced, which is common on selling restaurants. And we then found that they were making some single-sided entries, which meant they, their math was not correct. Maybe that's the advantage we have. We're able to see that. So from that those first two in, in Florida, and one of those is called George's at Alice Beach, A-L-Y-S. It's a very famous uh, area down there. And this area has just started booming. And, and I bought it in 2015. And that's one of the most popular restaurants in the southeast of, of the United States because so many people from the southeast go to this area for vacation. 
And I have people all the time just tell me, hey, this is this is we love coming here. Every every vacation they go down there and eat there at least one time a night. So we got lucky in some respects. We we bought from people that wanted to retire, that were just burnt out on the business. They had worked too hard. And and so we we had two, and then we had another gentleman come to us. This was Saltwater Grill in Panama City Beach. He was 150 pounds overweight. He had just had two knee replacements. He was on a scooter. He was 76 years old, and he and his scooter wouldn't go into his restaurant. He was forced to sell. And so that was our next purchase. So what was going on is people were were going, hey, we've got a dumb guy that will give you some liquidity and buy your restaurant. And I was the dumb guy. <laughs> so, so go that's how it, that's how it evolved. So did the uh, were the it was the incumbent staff as big a factor in those places as it was in your first purchase? George's at Alice Beach had a couple of great owners, George and Ann Hartley, that were we call them the king and queen of 30A, which is a very famous street down mm-hmm. between uh, uh, Destin and Panama City Beach. When 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 the deal was cut, and they were just beat, and they were ready to retire. Um, I, I made the mistake of going to the meeting with them as they disclosed it to their employees, and and these two people were so loved that immediately you had employees in tears. And now I have to say, hey, I'm the new owner. How about me? And and that wasn't the right time for that. And so you you learn a lot about each one of the deals is differently. Saltwater Grill, when I went to that, I, I, I the previous owner wasn't with me and we did our disclosure on April 1. Hey, employees, I'm Rick Spell, I'm buying your restaurant. Don't worry, we're gonna try not to change anything help us learn about you where we, you know, your job is protected. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's April 1st. We just want to make sure this isn't an April fool's joke and and you're not buying it. And so we just have been really lucky with great staff. You, you, uh, you added restaurants in both 2015 and 2016. What were some of the challenges associated, you know, when you first started managing restaurants, different types of restaurants in different locations, and then what was most enjoyable about it as well? <laughs> um, you might have to come back to the enjoyable part. The George's and Alice Beach was such an iconic restaurant, so well now known in the Southeast. Um, and 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 you know, we knew that the staff didn't know us was resistant. And frankly, we were trying to be absentee owners. We were coming down there once a month, but our manager was not as strong as we needed. And so right as we were making a decision on that, um, the chef uh, at that restaurant um, was involved with an employee. And so we, in essence, bought a restaurant that we couldn't screw up. And within two months, we had to replace the chef and the manager. And that was scary. And we brought somebody from Memphis that we knew in the restaurant business that happened to want to move down in that area. And he did a fabulous job. In fact, he was operations manager for a while. He's back now running that restaurant, Patrick Miller. Uh, and we we had a sous chef that that we let run through the, our, we call it 100 Days of Hell in the summer. Everybody's on the vacation down in Florida. And she did a fabulous job. And she's still with us as a chef. So uh, that was probably the scariest thing we had. Although I will tell you this. The Hurricane Michael, and I think that was 2017, which absolutely decimated uh, the east side of Panama City Beach, where so many of the workers live, that was unique. All of our restaurants were without power. And after a day or two, we said, look, all our food's going bad. And there's what we called a dark zone over there. You couldn't get any communication there. So we just cooked a bunch of food. And we had about four volunteers go to a fire station. And we said, you know, we said, look, we have food. And man, they they rushed all over us. And they said, and we said, well, where else can we go? He says, my my buddy John is the next fire department. And so we worked our way 40 miles through this dark zone, which is it's very hard to describe unless you've ever been around a hurricane. There's no communication. It's nothing but first responders. They're working their guts out. And we show up and feed them. And we had a young kid uh, about five or six years old. Um, I think it was the second or third day we went into the dark area and we, we, we gave him a chocolate chip cookie and he looked at it and he was like, 
you know, we were like, what, what's the matter? You, you know, do you want to eat your cookies? Like I haven't had anything to eat for two days. And, and, you know, that's what happens in hurricane displacement. That's what Florida faces. So we spend all summer long watching these tropical storms to see what they're going to do to us. And, and that is a big, uh, it's a big factor down here in Florida. In uh, 2017, so you added those restaurants in 2015, 2016, and then in 2017, you developed your own concept. Can you tell me a little bit about that and that process? You're talking about grits and grind? Yeah. So uh, I've always been a big lover of breakfast, and there's a restaurant in Memphis called Brother Jennifer's that I kept begging him to sell it to me. I never could talk him out of it. And so I had I had bought a building uh, at La, C- La Casina, which is now called Laco in Seacrest Beach. Uh, the, I have four restaurants within um, a quarter of a mile of each other. That's how big this vacation area is. Uh, so I wanted to, I had I owned the restaurant. And so it, being a finance guy, it was all about how much more revenue slash income can I, you know, get out of this building. I own the, I own the building also. And, and the kitchen was very large. And so, um, I, I, you know, I have a chef. He was a sous chef in another restaurant. He took over. I was able to promote him. Uh, and we had just a fabulous breakfast uh, menu. The, and, and, and it did incredibly well. The name Grits and Grind is, is based on the Memphis Grizzlies, a basketball team in Memphis. They had some just great defensive players. And they said, we're all grit and grind. And I was like, Grits and Grind, that's got to be the name. And so that's how that came about. Unfortunately, uh, starting this week, that area down there slows to nothing. People aren't on vacation when kids are in school and there's no pandemic and, and through the winter, there's no business. So I did just uh, close grits and grind, but I, I took Laco as it's called now and expanded the hours and we serve a brunch menu, but there just weren't a lot of people down on vacation, getting up at seven and eight in the morning to eat breakfast because they've been at the beach. They've been drinking all the previous night. So they want to roll into our Mexican restaurant later. So that's why I had to shut it down. But I, it was a pure love. I really enjoyed it. Was opening a, bre- a breakfast restaurant different than the other ones? Or was it, or is it all kind of the same operate, type, of, type of operations? It, it, it was different. In fact, the I have a love for breakfast and, I, and our product was great. But you only have a certain amount of hours to make money. So going through the slow season, it, it's just difficult to cut your your overhead enough to make it work. I made another mistake on that too. Uh, as a non-restaurateur, and any restaurant people on the phone, it's now you point your finger at me and go, that dummy, he didn't know that. We know that. The changeover from breakfast to lunch is, is difficult. And particularly since all our customers are coming in late, we were closing at 11 and uh, the breakfast restaurant closing at 1030, but they all wanted to rush in at the last minute, which made our lunch service bad. And then we set them up as separate operations. So the the breakfast people were in a hurry to just, you know, not clean completely. And, hey, it's all you. You take over. And so the the transition was was a really difficult thing that I learned some lesson about that my managers and my restaurant experience people told me in advance. That, that was that was actually difficult doing that out of one kitchen. What would have been a better way to do it? I think if I put all management under one head person uh, that it, so I was trying to promote somebody. But having the same building run by two people, um, it, it ended up not the transition just ended up not being as good. And I probably should have put that under one corporation or run it that way. And then you also added another restaurant that same year that you started Grits and Grime. There was a restaurant called. So there was two restaurants that we haven't talked about. Uh, there was a restaurant called La Crema. It's, it's in Rosemary Beach. It's incredibly popular, up to three hour waits in the vacation season in the summer. Um, it, it's, it's small dishes and they sell get a, a Spanish get a nacho wine, which is a very soft wine that I really love. And I, I sent this guy an email and I said, love your restaurant. Uh, love your get a nacho wine. If you ever want to sell your restaurant, let me know. Or if you want to just sit down and talk about Spanish wines, I'd love to do that. And he emailed me a year later. And he said, are you in town? And I wasn't, my daughter was living down there at that time. And I said, well, I'm not. He said, uh, well, I'd love to meet you. And if you, if you want to buy my restaurant, I, I'd love to sell it to you. And we ended up buying that restaurant uh, and we make more yearly in profit than what we paid for it. And it's just it's one of the most iconic and well-loved restaurants down there. 
we we don't change the name on these restaurants. Uh, you know, we have George's that I bought from George Hartley. I have another one called Edwards that I bought from Edward. And um, and that was a that's more of a fine dining restaurant. And uh, this year we we've, we've added lunch and we are adding a little upstairs area to it. And its sales have gone through the roof. We've just been really lucky. We've done a lot with our restaurant. So people come into the restaurant, put their name down, and they say it's a three hour wait, and they don't back out. Well, you know, it's it's kind of like being on a. Um, I had that happen to me. I went to uh, Atlantis in uh, the Bahamas. And I, I'm a last minute guy. And I said, okay, well, what's the eating arrangements? And, you know, you have to walk to restaurants that are a long way away. So everybody eats right there. Well, they only have five restaurants. They said, look, if you don't make reservations, you're going to be eating at 5.30 or 9.30. Well, I don't like to plan in advance. And, and so that's what it is when you're in a vacation. You have so many people that are down there. The whole system is stressed. And, and so people love this restaurant so much that, in essence, what these people are doing, they're putting their names on about five different places. Okay, and then they go first. But La Crema is known for its chocolate desserts. So you have a lot of people that uh, will wait for that dessert. And so the average wait there in the summer is probably about an hour and a half. Uh, if you're there six or after, you're going to have a long wait. But yes, we have definitely quoted times of three hours and we do it every month in the summer. You and your daughter both have backgrounds in accounting. You've mentioned some ways that that's probably paid off for you. What are some of the biggest ways you'd say that it's helped both of you? So um, it, it's just a total different way of looking at restaurants. Uh, there's some Restaurant tours here in Memphis. Uh, if anybody's listening, I'll, I'll help you find them. They are James Beard Award winners, and there's not a huge amount of those around. And they are exceptional restaurant tours and exceptional restaurant or tours that I like to go to their restaurants. Uh, Andrew Michael are, are their names. It's uh, two two guys, uh, Andrew Tyser and Michael Hudson, and uh, great guys. And uh, they called me one time. And they said, Rick what are you doing? And I said, well, why don't, you know, this is November. I said, why don't we, at the, after the end of the year, let's, let's get our financial statements for our operations. And I'll tell you about each one of my restaurants, actually a little bit of what we're doing right now. And then you tell me about yours. And so uh, by uh, January 10th, I have all my financials and I sit down and I go, Andy, here's, here's what I do in all my restaurants. And you know, two months later, maybe three months later, he says, OK, Rick, I'm ready to talk to you. Well, think about that. I have my information immediate and I can make better management decisions. My daughter uh, oversees the, the operation and she now has financials to me three days after the month in. So that allows us to see what's going on. For example, everyone knows in the last three months, the trend in, in food cost protein particularly is going up. And my my Chefs were warning me in advance. They said, Rick, I, I, we've done really good on our food costs. We are not going to do good for the next two or three months. By the way, we have not raised prices yet. We're hoping this will even out. Uh, oh, we've been fortunate to have so many guests come in through the pandemic. We just don't want to harm anybody. But yes, as a restaurateur, our costs for labor are going up. Our costs for food are going up. And so I guess the point I would make, we, we, are, we just are more adept at what's going on as far as the costs and ways to improve it. And this is where I have to compliment my daughter. When we took over Bobbley, which we took over that restaurant chain out, of, we bought it out of bankruptcy. We did against quite a few other people. Uh, they were using a lot of services uh, to save costs. Hey, you know, use us. We can save you costs. Of course, we get a little bit of that cost savings. And so we looked at their pricing and all the contracts they signed with the different places. Ours were lower. And, and that's my daughter that was was doing uh, some of the the global buying that we're doing. So we just have been lucky. We're able to save costs here. We're able to pay our employees uh, well. Uh, and we try to create an environment where they like each other and, 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 and hopefully like us. So it's just a combination of things. But, for example, what, I'm, I'm, I want to still try to stay on, on what your question was. One of the things that we do, because our restaurants in Florida shut down, uh, some of them, two of them do in the, in the winter, but it's slow there. We always plan for our capital improvements right now. And, and we try not to let the restaurant just stay the same. We're always trying, for example, at George's, 
in the summer in the heat, everybody wants to be outside, but you don't want to be outside without an umbrella. If it's 85 degrees, it gets hot in the sun. So we have a, a, a pad, a, a outdoor eating area, which is called the lily pad. And we, we went ahead and covered half of that. You're still outside, but if it's raining, I don't lose that spot. When I first had that restaurant, uh, I had about 130 seats and half of them were outdoor and half of them were indoor. So if it rained, and by the way, in Florida, it rains almost every afternoon, half of my restaurant disappeared. So I built the I, I, my porch. I covered that after the first year. And this year, I started covering my outdoor side porch. So we're, we still give people an outdoor environment, but we keep the sun off of them. I'm right now, I, I have, you know, we all use the propane heaters. Um, you know, we have started going back in and, and doing the permanent heaters because restaurant people, are great at serving guests. But I guarantee you every year, this time of year, when it gets cold, none of the restaurateurs, none of my managers have ever convinced me that they're going to have their heaters out in advance, know they work, and have propane in them. Normally, it's two weeks after it's cold. And, you know, I walk in and I see people shivering. So those are just small things that we do. It haven't been around so many restaurants. COVID has, uh, it's affected all of us in some way. It's affected a lot of industries, especially the restaurant industry. How did it affect you guys? So um, I was fortunate to have other great careers. And, and so we were able to, through some of the savings, I, through that, I was able to buy these restaurants. Um, and so when I started hearing about the pandemic, I was like, you know, whatever, you know, I, you know I'm fine. And I was talking to my banker and she said, and she acted worried. I'm like, I don't know what you're worried about. And then it was the next day, my, you know, we were starting to shut down and my daughter gave me a cash flow statement. And we realized that after laying, we were closing all the restaurants and after laying off all of the people that were on hourly, but keeping managers on salary. Uh, we were negative over $2 million cash flow quarterly. Wow. That's $8 million a year. So, and I just was kind of flipping and not realizing because I, you know, you just don't look at a restaurant 20% down in business. That can happen. You don't think about restaurants going to zero. It is impossible uh, to, to, there's just no way around it. And And here's the other thing. The owners of the properties, the landlords, I own some of my properties, most I don't, they're in the same spot. And so it was very, very scary. Uh, yes, you stay up at night. Yes, you wonder about surviving. Um, and, and the government came in with plans uh, very quickly and, and they saved us. Now, recognize that we're hearing about this pandemic, but none of us knew anything. Even the scientists, nobody knew anything. So we didn't know if we were going to be shut down for nine months, two years. And so uh, it was it was interesting. Those first few months, uh, I had two or three people at every restaurant down in our areas doing to go. A couple of them I didn't open. They just a couple of the finer dining. It just it, it, you couldn't do enough business. And by the way, when you're nothing but to go at my restaurants, um, you lose money. I have a friend here in Memphis, Barry Pelt, who owned at that time Corky's Barbecue, and and they could live on to go. I mean, people they have a drive through, and 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 they could make it work. Ours, forget about it. You're you're at a big loss. But we were able to keep some people on, and my wife and I would go up to uh, different restaurants every night, and we were able to be in the restaurant. So I hope nobody arrests me for this. Mm -hmm. We were the only people served, and we'd sit there and and talk to the people and you know, commiserate and talk about what we're going through. And, and, and it was just a kind of a very family environment there for a while. And then fortunately, uh, when you were able to reopen, a lot of people were scared. We fortunately had, try to have outdoor dining at all of our restaurants. And so there are a lot of people to this day that still only want to eat outside. So, but, but a lot of people rushed to Florida and we got really lucky there. So if there's any restaurant tours, listening. I, I'm certainly not trying to be cocky. And, and that's why I told you how negative cash flow I was. It was a matter of survival. But being in Florida, people wanted to 
um, be outside and they could go to the beach and be, you know, six feet apart from people. And, and so we were just, we got really lucky on where we owned our restaurant. If you're in New York city, if you're in Los Angeles, you know, I know there's some places that have really, really struggled, but our weather allowed us to survive better than most. Uh, in Memphis right now, uh, we are still under a mask uh, requirement. You enter a restaurant with a mask, you can take it off when you sit down. Florida, I have my, I'm, I'm this week taking my employees out of masks. Um, and everybody else is out of masks previous to this. But we, when the Delta virus hit Florida before us, we could see how bad it was. It was much worse than the first one. So I don't know. I, I know I'm rambling, but it's been traumatic. We survived. The government performed a function. I know there's a lot of people who don't like government, but it performed a function. And uh, so, you know, look, there's a, there's a lot of political involvement in COVID. And I, I don't I don't care about any of that. When somebody wants to talk politically about COVID, all I say is, look, I just want this behind us. Because let me tell you, it isn't fun when you know that you have to lay people off. And uh, when when the environment hit. Um, I, I, I went to, uh, and every, all the employees knew they were getting laid off because we were closing and I had my people at Brookhaven. There you go back to the first one. And I sat down with them and I'm about to announce what we're going to do. And, and, uh, and I couldn't talk. I was in tears because I'm about, I looked around this room at people with smiles on their face that were great people and I controlled their jobs and I was about to not be able to pay them. Boy, that was tough. And you know what their answer was? This was a 10 o'clock meeting. They said, Rick, since you can't pay us, do you mind if we drink for the next hour? And that hour became about five or six hours. <laughs> and I finally had to stop it. But, you know, there's just a lot of great people and a lot of them are in the restaurant business that will uh, make something great out of something bad. And I, I don't, I, I just can't tell you how many employees we had that have said, hey, thanks for helping us through this when I'm still guilty about not being able to help people through as well as I'd like. So we are a couple of final questions for you. We're big fans of publicly acknowledging people who have been influential for you. Has there been anybody or a few people within the restaurant industry that you, you know, especially since you were coming into it kind of cold in terms of your restaurant tour experience? Are there anybody is there anybody in the industry that you've really kind of leaned on and looked to for advice? Uh, you know, I'd have to say no, uh, because I'm so non-restaurant like uh, that I just had to learn by the seat of our pants. And uh, you actually have done a good job, Chad, of, of, of maybe highlighting Brookhaven, which I owned from 04 mm -hmm. and then bought the other restaurants in 2015 and then just started buying. And by the way, I'm trying to buy more. So anybody in my areas or other areas that they want to sell a restaurant, call me. Up. I'm happy to talk to you. My wife's not happy to for me to talk to you, but I'm happy to talk to you. Um, it, we, we did, we, I just have to say that, that I am blessed with the greatest staff of managers and chefs. And, and, and I've learned from them. Now they're learning from me because my strength is finance. And, and you know what, my daughter and I are pretty good at what we do, but we're not good uh, at, at serving guests at, you know, at cooking, we're not good. And so I go into my restaurants and watch the rhythm of people in a restaurant. And, and by the way, a lot of customers do too, because they talk to me about it. And, and so I, I was, I didn't, I guess I'm unfortunate that I didn't have someone in the restaurant business that could guide me. But I tell you what, I can start naming people like Patrick Miller and Chris Joyner and Jimmy Berry and Andrew Preble and, uh, you know, Camille, I've, I've just got so many people that that I've worked with that we all learn together and we all, you know, we live or die together. And so my real heroes are the people that that I'm fortunate to work with. How often did you say you check in on each place? Um, well, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and I eat at one of my I generally try to eat at uh, one of at, at two restaurants a day. So I don't. I, last night was my night to eat another restaurant, and then, then I'll eat lunch and dinner at my restaurants. When I'm in Florida, um, I I eat, I have five restaurants in that area, and and I eat it one or two a day. I, I eat virtually ninety percent of the time at my restaurants, 
And, and a lot of it is because I like the food, but it's also because I can sit there and watch how they're treating guests. And I can see them screwing up sometimes and I can see them being great. So anytime I'm in my restaurant, I'm, I'm looking and I'm watching and I'm seeing how clean the, the rest of the uh, restroom is and, 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 and anything else. And so, and, and so I have one restaurant in Jackson, Mississippi, and that's the one I don't make it down enough to. And I'm only there maybe once every two or three months. Where can people find out more about your group of restaurants? So if you'll go to the, uh, the website, spellrestaurantgroup.com, uh, S-P-E-L-L, just like you're trying to spell my name, spellrestaurantgroup.com. Uh, you can look on there uh, and you'll see we have four restaurants in Rosemary Beach and Alice Beach, one restaurant in Panama City Beach. Those are all within 15 miles, but four of them are within, you know, a quarter of a mile. And then we have three here in Memphis, two Bobaloos and, and one uh, a Brookhaven and then a Bobaloo in Jackson. Hey, Rick, I, I uh, can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate you joining me today. It was great talking to you. Chad, it was my pleasure. Thanks for putting this on. And call me if you're selling a restaurant. All right. Thank you. And so long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.